All right, now in the previous sections uh, regarding the Hebrew cosmos and the Greek uh, cosmos, I've designated this as the rise of the universe cosmos. Uh, now we're going to be talking about the fall of the universe cosmos. Now the, uh, the Greek cosmos lasted 2,000 years without really any serious challenge. Uh, but now we're talking about the taking apart of the uh, universe cosmos. Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, and Newton. Copernicus did not liberate our consciousness from the conception of the universe cosmos, nor did Galileo, nor Kepler, nor Newton. All of these great minds passed their way without marshalling one bit of evidence capable of casting a reasoned doubt on, on the reality of the great vault. Although they pointed the way and inspired Edmund Haley, the theories of all four of these men were confined to our solar system. All, far, all four of these revolutionary scientists left the solid sky standing. The theory of uh, Nicholas Copernicus, 1473 to 1543, brought the daily rotation of the Great Vault to a halt by transferring this daily rotation to the Earth itself. The Great Vault was thus stripped of part of its mystique. The theory of Copernicus cut the ground from beneath the developments of the, that the Greeks added to this simple perception of the great vault. The theory of the four chemical elements with their natural movements in relationship with the absolute center of the universe was incompatible with the sun-centered cosmos of Copernicus. The reality of the great vault, however, was not called into question. Galileo Galilei 1564 to 1642, improved the telescope and observed in detail the features of the moon. He discovered the four largest moons of Jupiter. He supported the Copernican heliocentric model. He was confined to house arrest by the Catholic Church until his death. Johannes Kepler, 1571 to 1630 discovered that the paths of the planets were ellipses and not the perfect circles asserted by Plato and Aristotle. Isaac Newton's theory of gravity and the laws of motion were generalized to include all motion within the solar system. No claim was made, however, that these laws applied to the stars. Newton states, that among those bodies in the celestial regions, we have no experiments nor any manner of observation. That brings us to uh, Halley. It was not until 1718 that the first potent evidence challenging the great vault came to light. The ancient Greeks had recorded the relative positions of the visible stars the first to do so in a systematic manner was Hipparchus, who about 134 BC had recorded the positions of over 800 stars. His was the first important star map, and it was uh, preserved for posterity by Ptolemy, who increased the number of stars it contained to more than a thousand. In 1718, Edmund Haley, 1656 to 1742, studying the positions of the stars, noted that at least three stars, Sirius, Pro Procyon, and Arcturus, were not in the locations recorded by the Greeks. The difference in position was so great that it was unlikely that either the Greeks or Haley could have been mistaken. Haley found Arcturus, for instance, to be a full degree, twice the apparent width of the full moon, 
away from the position recorded by the Greeks. It seemed clear to Halley that these stars had moved. They were not truly fixed stars at all, but had proper motions of their own. The proper motions of the stars were exceedingly slow compared to those of the planets and did not make themselves evident from day to day or even year to year. But from generation to generation, the slow proper motions of the stars succeeds in displacing them perceptibly against the sky. The mere existence of proper motions among the stars was a terrible blow to the solid sky hypothesis. At least some of the stars were not attached to the vault, and the feeling grew at once that none of the stars were, that indeed there was no vault. Stellar Parallax At the very least, Halley had demonstrated three exceptions to the classical assumption that the stars were attached to the Great Vault. The Great Vault was soon rejected as a tenable scientific hypothesis. The opposite hypothesis that the stars were widely scattered through a great expanse of space was put forward. If this alternate hypothesis was true, then the stars stood at widely different distances from the Earth. Under the vault model, the race was up. The race was on to turn up evidence of unequal stellar distances. How this was to be done had long been understood. A pencil held at arm's length appears to move back and forth in relationship to background objects in the room when looked at now with one eye open, now with the other. For an object only at arm's length away, the shifting of the point of observation a mere three inches between the two eyes uh, provides a basis for calculating the distance of the pencil by means of trigonometry. Problem solving, problems involving objects at a greater distance can be resolved by moving a sufficient number of paces perpendicular to the line of vision. Measurements of the distance of the moon were obtained by observing the position of the moon relative to background stars simultaneously from points of distant observation. Soon after the invention of the telescope, the distance of Mars had been determined in 1671 by Jean Rooker and Cassini by the same method. This method, known as parallax, applied to the problem of measuring the distances of the stars from the Earth, required points of observation separated by a distance far greater than any two points on Earth. Knowledge of the motion of the Earth around the Sun provided new points of observation separated by immense distances. The first observed case of stellar parallax of uh, 61 Cygni, nevertheless, was not reported until 1838 Alpha. by F.W. Bessel. Reports of two other measurements of stellar parallax by Wilhelm Stuhl on Vega and by Thomas Henderson on Alpha Centauri were presented in 1839 and 1840. The theory of widely scattered stars was now more than an idle hypothesis. It was a hypothesis that arose from Halley's empirical observation of proper motions of three stars, and the discovery of stellar parallax now added great empirical support to the scattered star hypothesis. It is mentioned in passing that it was only with the discovery of stellar parallax that the Copernican theory regarding the Earth's annual orbit around the, moon, around the Sun was secured beyond reasonable doubt. With the Earth at the center of the solar system, the greatest distance between points of observation would be the diameter of the Earth, 7,918 miles. With the Sun at the center, uh, uh, 
it, uh, the distances would be the diameter of the Earth's orbit, 186 million miles. The Crab Nebula. It may not seem necessary to introduce the supernovae, exploding stars, and colliding galaxies as additional evidence in refutation of the idea of the universe cosmos. It might still be argued, however, that although the universe lacked the architectural symmetry once erroneously attributed to it, it was still a magnificent spectacle of divine order and harmony. The Crab Nebula looks for all the world like a vast explosion caught in mid-expansion. It takes no imagination at all to see that. The conclusion forces itself on any observer. The fact that it is located in just about the spot where the Chinese astronomers of 1054 had placed their supernova made it very tempting to consider the Crab Nebula the remnant of that explosion. And by the mid-1920s, when astronomers came to understand the fact that such supernovae existed, this view was generally accepted. The universe is clearly not a magnificent spectacle of divine order. There is great chaos in the universe that is not confined to Earth. The model of the universe constructed by modern science is not a model of a finished production. When we contemplate the universe, we no longer enjoy the sense of comfort and satisfaction of the ancients who felt that they had grasped the divine idea. Carl Sagan has taught us to see a brighter side of the Crab Nebula. He taught us to see the higher elements of our bodies as made in stellar explosions. When our solar system began four and a half billion years ago, the materials it was made from were the debris of former stars. We are made of star stuff.